Insurance agents from around the world, welcome to the Insurance Guys podcast. My name is Scott Howell, your fearless host and leader, insurance agency owner and insurance evangelist for iProtect Insurance and Financial Services based out of Huntsville, Alabama. And before we get started on today's episode, please help me welcome, he is a six foot three sophomore from Sarah Land, Alabama, parade first team All-American rivals, five-star recruit. He is a fantastic insurance agent and a great American. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand and welcome my friend, Mr. Bradley Flowers. How are you, Bradley? I'm great, Scott. How are you today? Man, I, I'm the best I have ever been. Guys, I've got somebody that I have been wanting to get in the boat with uh, probably for six months on this podcast today. I My personal opinion will be that this will probably be one of the best podcasts we have ever done. Uh, our mission on this podcast is to help you insurance agents in any way we can. Sometimes we do that with what I would like to refer to as unorthodox methods. <laughs> uh, Bradley is very open and honest about how eccentric I am. Uh, if you'd like, I can pull up my timer on my phone of when I'm going to die. Would you like to see that right now, Bradley? <laughs> I'm good. I've seen it. Okay. Um, so, so I do have a timer on my phone that tells me exactly when I'm going to die. Both of my grandfathers died at around age 80. Uh, as, as all of you know, when you go into a doctor's office for an exam, the first thing that a doctor wants to talk about is medical history. Medical doctors place a lot of emphasis on, on your, on your, uh, family's background, DNA, you know, when did your parents die? When did your family die? So what I've done in order to uh, make sure that I live every single day to its fullest for the rest of my life is I have created a countdown timer on my phone that is titled, When Scott is Going to Die. I took the death of both of my grandfathers at age 80 years old. I added five years for medical science, <laughs> subtracted the day I was born, and right now, I could look at my phone and tell everybody on this podcast, give or take a few months or maybe a year of exactly when I'm going to die. And I look at that every single day to remind myself to live to, to my fullest. What cracks me up about it is you posted that on Facebook. I think it was Jason Cass commented and said, hey, well, you don't believe in... Uh Pre, are you believing predetermined so, something like that? And Scott goes, uh, no, I believe that I'm going to die when this calculator says I'm going to die. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, that's. I mean, that's pretty much it. Uh, and and there are articles, uh, medical journal articles that will that talk about, uh, you know, that that evidence suggests that more and more that that when when you look at your family history, they can pretty much. I mean, granted, if you go die in a car wreck on I-65 through an accident next week that that is certainly kind of throws that out the window but natural cause wise uh there is some 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 evidence that suggests that that is correct but guys i, I want to go ahead today and introduce our very special guest and he is somebody that you know gary vaynerchuk talked to us and talked to me specifically about admiration i cannot tell you how much I admire the, the, the man that we're about to bring on this podcast right now for a lot of reasons. Uh, you know, there are those people in your life that you meet and you instantly, as soon as you meet them, you, you have a connection with them and you feel a certain way about them, good or bad. And when I met this guy that's about to come on this podcast today, I felt an immediate connection with him, and I felt like he was somebody that was going to be in my life for a long time. Now, with that said, we've been around each other two or three on two or three occasions, and we've never really had the opportunity to to connect and really get in the boat with each other and spend quality time talking. So we're going to do that for the next hour. I don't know where this is go going to go. <laughs> he and I just spent fifteen or twenty minutes in a very deep conversation over over lunch. Uh, this could go anywhere. It could, this will probably turn into the Joe Rogan podcast, but without <laughs> further ado. So he is a graduate of both Auburn University and the University of Alabama's School of Law. We're going to talk about that a little bit. He, he is married to the beautiful Beth Reddit Tyndall, and they have three beautiful baby girls. He is a purebred entrepreneur and, in my opinion, one of the top 1% entrepreneurs in the United States of America. He has co-founded more companies than I can actually mention on this podcast today or we would run out of time. 
He has been he has been featured on the on the ABC hit show Shark Tank. Uh, if you want something done in Mobile, Alabama, guys, this this is your guy. This is the guy that you're going to call to get shit done it's in Mobile, fairly Alabama. Accurate. Yes. So, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I would like to introduce Mr. Mobile, the incomparable Mr. Scott Tindall. How are you, Scott? I'm fantastic. I just hope I can live up to that introduction. <laughs> no, uh, no, no, I appreciate no. the kind words, though. I feel the same. Um, I really do think that there's something inherent about meeting someone and, and getting a feeling on mm-hmm. how that interaction will go forward. So, Absolutely. Uh, but I just appreciate being here, and I, I think what you guys do is great. And, uh, you know, insurance is not within my realm, right. but I think we'll just talk a lot about life and things that are practical across Mm-hmm. Everywhere and this, you know, what y'all do is really not an insurance podcast, right? It's like a, it's a human betterment podcast. Absolutely, yeah. you know. So that's why I'm pumped to be but here. Before we get started, there's a story that that you've never told me. You told my wife, and I want you to tell Scott the story. And I purposely did not get you to tell it out there because <laughs> I want to see his reaction. Tell the story about how you met Colby Cooper. Oh man, that's a, a good story. So Colby Cooper has become one of my best friends in the world. And this is like, we talk about relationships and why relationships matter. It's part of the core ethos of what we do. So I had uh, been practicing as an attorney for a while and really wasn't enjoying what I was doing. I uh, wasn't particularly good at it either. Uh, most of the practice of law is retrospective, right? It's what judges have already decided. My brain's always looking forward on how do we create new things and then actually go do those new things. So I got a call from a friend and, um, he basically said, hey, do you want to come be employee number one and help me start an international maritime security company? I said, sure. What does that mean? <laughs> he goes, well, we just got to figure out how to move men and weapons around the Middle East to protect against Somali-based piracy. Oh. And I said, no, yeah, this is uh, okay. The Captain Yeah, it's right after thing. Captain Phillips. So, you know, that Tom Hanks movie, Captain Phillips, is based on a true story. And it was based, uh, that ship, the Marist Alabama, was mm-hmm. actually managed by a group out of Mobile. So he calls me and he says, you yeah, know, would you be interested in that? I said, yeah. I said, how do we do it? Guns and weapons and people. Men men and weapons across the world, you know? And I said, I have no idea how we are going to do this. Um, And he had been working on on trying to get it formulated. So I did what any other person would do when you want to figure out how to move guns around the world. I got on Google. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) And and what I found was that it was... Give it 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 a Google. Got yourself on a list, probably. (laughs) I'm on more than one list, I assure you. (laughs) Um, for some stories that won't go on this podcast. But um, so I did what you would do, right? And I figured, realized, all right, the State Department regulates this here in the United States. And so then, like, through my Google search, I found out that this man named Colby Cooper, who had been the chief of staff for Condoleezza Rice for 12 years, had just moved to Fairhope. And for me, I was like, wow, this guy would know everything I, I right. need to know or at least get me started. So I just cold called him. Right. said, hey, sir, you don't know me, but... My name's Scott Tindall, and this is what we're trying to do. Do you have any advice? And he said, what are you doing for lunch today? I said, whatever you tell me to. And so literally we met at the Bluegill uh, mm-hmm. restaurant down here on the causeway and spent three hours together, and that gave us a tremendous jump start right. to what we said is we were attorneys, and there were a lot of people that were do- trying to do this, mm-hmm. and they weren't necessarily worried about doing it legally. Right. Right? They just – it was – the companies were scared. They right. were worried. So they would take anybody they could that would come and put guns on these boats. And – we just decided we weren't going to do it that way. But what happened through that was Colby and I became tremendous friends mm-hmm. and is today in my top very, very close handful of friends and literally came through a cold call. And I would say like some of my biggest mentors right now are people I met through that capacity mm-hmm. and were just such kind and giving people mm-hmm. that they just started pouring into my life. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's So we just talk about it being a mentorship loop. You've mm-hmm. always got to have people pouring into you, mm-hmm. but there's something inside of you that you can pour into somebody else. Sure. Even if you don't think you, you should be mentoring, oh, I don't have anything to share. It, it can just be your mistakes, right? right? If we can right. learn from other people's mistakes, that helps solve a tremendous amount of problems. And like, that's why I need to be all of your mentors, because I've made so many of those that I can share all the <laughs> damn stupid things I've done in my life. Well, there's a lot to that. Uh, oh. I tell our team that all the time. I mean, one one of the things that helps us keep evolving our companies is we have done so many things in, in different realms. Mm-hmm. And we take pieces and parts from each of those mm-hmm. and put it together and know that we're still going to make mistakes, mm-hmm. but are we putting ourselves in the best position possible for a successful outcome? Mm-hmm. What are the odds here? You know, we can get into odds-based decision-making rather than results-based decision-making later, but it's like, what are we doing for that? And so, yeah, that, that Colby story, you know... The, I just think it's the, interesting, like, all the things you've done, nobody talks about moving 
guns and men to prevent <laughs> against Somalian pirates in yeah, the Middle East. Yeah, that was an interesting uh, experience. So so let's talk a little bit about, and you and I just had, had this discussion, so I apologize if we re- regurgitate some of this information. Talk a little bit about the lessons learned on Shark Tank. You're up in front of the the, the mil- billionaires and and you're you know t- I guess first, talk about your the company yeah, too because the our listeners probably then, don't know yeah and then and then the experience on Shark Tank sure so we had a what we considered was a technology company called Tie Try and um, basically it was we considered it like the Netflix for neckties so you know if everybody remembers when Netflix used to actually have to send you a DVD in the mail rather right. than streaming uh, it was that process you would mm-hmm. get men's neckties mm-hmm. um, for a fixed monthly rate and for you know. $29 a month, you could get five ties at a time. And these are $80, $100 ties that you're always circling through. We paid for shipping both ways. So as much as you wanted to use the product, you could and get tremendous value out of that. And um, so without any money, we didn't have any marketing money at all. Uh, we did a process we called fishing and it helped us get on Shark Tank. And what we did was um, there wasn't a lot of businesses in the sharing economy, right? It's mm-hmm. 2012. So Airbnb is not big. Uber's not big. They exist, but most people don't even know mm-hmm. they exist. Uh, rent the runway was ahead of us. Mm-hmm. So in the women's space, at least there was a model there of women renting dresses. And we said, we don't have any money. It's going to be incredibly expensive to educate people that this product exists. Uh, how are we going to do that? So we caught a fishing and just like you cast a net and catch bait. That's what we did. So we found bloggers who were in the fashion and technology world and said, Hey, you're the best fashion writer around. You're the best technology blogger mm-hmm. around. I can't believe you haven't written about this business yet. We didn't tell them that we owned the company, right? right? We just right. said, we just want to put this on your radar. They would write articles about the company. We would take those and we'd send them to like local newspaper writers. Mm-hmm. Hey, look, all these blogs are talking about this. You're the best right. business writer in Savannah. I can't believe you haven't talked about this yet. We'd take those, package them together, send them to regional writers, mm-hmm. then send them to national correspondents. And through that, we were able to get on basically every major network you could want, including the Today Show, NPR, Fox Business, MSNBC, <laughs> all those. And we then packaged those up into our Shark Tank application and said, we've spent zero dollars on advertising. Here's where we've been. Uh, This is what we think we can do. And this goes back to the other part of what I talk about. It's not just about relationships. It's about luck. I mean, Mm -hmm. sometimes you just have to get lucky. I think Mm -hmm. there were like 7,000 businesses that applied that year. Mm -hmm. You know, Uh, we were lucky that our company was seen to be innovative at the time. Mm -hmm. And we were able to, I guess, capture their attention. Mm -hmm. And so... You know, you just have to take advantage of those opportunities when you get them. So, you know, we get on Shark Tank and, you know, it's this amazing experience. And what they don't normally tell you is you're actually in there for an hour, 90 minutes. Just depends. I think we were in there a little over an hour. They edit it down to that 8 to to 10 to 12 minutes, whatever you see. And I tell people, like, it's all about the edit. While you're in there, you say enough stuff to make you look intelligent. You say enough stuff to make you look foolish. Right. You just hope that you get an honest edit. And we did. I thought we got a really good, fair edit. Right. And so, you know kind of goes pretty fast uh robert hertzvik says you know we're too early and he was right i mean we'd we had launched the company in Mm -hmm. really february ish when we were full speed and we recorded in june Mm -hmm. so i mean we're not old at all it's very fast and so he said you're just too early i said i i agree completely and um but i also said i'm here because this is the day you told me to be here you tell me what day to come back and i'll be back here on that day right um he kind of laughed no (laughs) not really uh barbara hurt uh said uh just wasn't for her and uh she didn't think that um, it was really going to be the thing that she wanted to be a part of. Kevin O'Leary offers us 50% of what we're asking for if we can get another shark on board. So now we feel like we got some life, you know, two down. Yeah. Now I got Kevin in, and I'm going, oh, all I got to do is close this thing out at this point. Right. So immediately we go to Damon uh, with his fashion background. no one wants to partner with Kevin. So. <laughs> yeah, right? I mean, <laughs> it's one of those. Um, so then – you know, Damon says, well, I don't think y'all have a passion for fashion. I don't hear mm-hmm. anything about the knots. I don't hear anything about the fabrics, how this right. style is going to go with this pattern and those things. I said, well, Damon, our guys don't really have a passion for fashion either. I mean, they're renting ties. They just want to not look silly, right. you know, in front of their, their coworkers. And in fact, a lot of our subscribers were actually TV broadcasters on local TV stations, right? right. They're on TV every night. They don't make a ton of money. They, they don't want to get called out for wearing the same ties over and over. Right. It was a perfect model for them. Uh, but he was right. We didn't have a passion for that. So like one of the great lessons from that is like they shouldn't have invested in us. They made the right decision because mm-hmm. I now as somebody who, you know, looks to try and find companies like that, like 
I don't want to invest in somebody that's not passionate. Mm-hmm. You know, that goes back to kind of our core ethos. And we'll talk about that. Well, but grit is this unique combination of passion and perseverance. Mm-hmm. If you're not passionate about it, you're not going to persevere when hard times come up. And there are going to be hard times. You know, the only thing that I can tell you, success is not guaranteed, but the struggle is guaranteed. Mm-hmm. That is going to happen. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, he made the right decision. So mm-hmm. he passes on us. And now we're down to Mark. And we probably spent 20 minutes with Mark really getting into the details of the technology, mm-hmm. getting into the details of customer acquisition cost. We didn't have a good answer on customer acquisition costs. He tried to nail us to the wall on this and mm-hmm. say, well, you don't know. And I was like, no, Mark, I don't know. We're, we're a few months old. Because his point was, what happens when the free publicity runs out? Right. What's it going to cost to add a customer? Right. So, well, these are our projections. He said, but you don't know. So, of course, I don't know. These are the projections. Mm-hmm. And um, so it was kind of a sticking point. But then what I really learned from him was he said, what are you going to do when this company's, you know, making two million bucks a month? And I paused, and I was telling you the story earlier. I think, in reality, the pause was probably not very long, a microsecond. Right. In my brain, it seemed like an eternity, thinking like, well, I'm just this kid from public school in rural Mobile County, Alabama, that's out here in L.A. shooting a national TV show. Like, if we get to that point, man, we've, we've made, made it. it. Yeah, we yeah. have made it. And he looked at me. And like I said, I think it was just a fraction of a second. I don't think this was even on the part that aired. He said, I'm not interested in investing in a $20 million business. I want to invest in a $200 million business. you got to think bigger. At the time, I was like, oh, okay, Mark. In retrospect, seven years later, I see that as like one of the pivotal moments Mm -hmm. of going, yeah, that's right. Like my vision is too narrow. It's too small. Like, um, but that needs to be defined for everybody. Mm -hmm. Nobody, everybody needs to define what their own vision of success is going to look like. And, that's okay. Just whatever you want success mm-hmm. to look like. Mm-hmm. But then you got to create a success formula on how you're going to get there. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a, you got to have a roadmap on how right. you're going to get there. So that was kind of the two big lessons I took away from Shark Tank was you got to be passionate about what you're doing um, if you if you really want to be successful. Mm-hmm. And it's okay to think bigger. It's okay mm-hmm. to expand your scope and your horizon to find the right fit for you wherever that may be. You know, Elon Musk wants to go to Mars. Right. That's not something that I'm interested in, but that's within his scope of his vision. Right. Does so it get mind, any bigger than that? <laughs> I, yeah, it's a good question, you know. but Not it's only like going to Mars, but sending people to colonizing. live there yeah, forever. Yeah, he wants to colonize Mars. Yeah. So that's even beyond the scope of what I dream of, but everybody's got to find their own scope of vision, you know. So, so you've got your hands in lots of different companies relative to what you're working on right now. Lots of projects, lots of different things. Uh, you, how do you find your passion and how do you delegate your time relative to each one of these companies? I mean, do you have a, I'm going to work for three hours today on this and then three hours on this, or how, how do you do that exactly? That is um, a very good question. Because because I've I've looked up some of the stuff that you're involved with right now, and there's, there's, there's so many different companies. I know you have to probably touch, fire, and forget, touch, fire, and forget. Is that kind of how you do it? Yeah, so I think you have to have the self-awareness to know what you're really good at. Right and surround yourself with a team of people who have a diversity of skills to augment your weaknesses. Right. So I say I need to be spending as much of my time as possible doing things that's the highest and best use of my time. Mm-hmm. I don't need to be fooling with things that are not the best use of my time um, because there's too many things to do. That doesn't mean I'm too important to do those things. It mm-hmm. just means if it takes me an hour to do something that somebody else on my team can do in 15 minutes, right. I need to let them do it and get out of their way right. and let them be good at their jobs doesn't mean that like mm-hmm. I wouldn't go do it, but they're better at that. Like There are some things that I just don't need to be doing. Mm-hmm. I need to be dreaming the dreams, casting the visions, building relationships mm-hmm. with clients, mm-hmm. um, and then figuring out what deliverables they need and how we can execute on those. Mm-hmm. So I, I hope that I spend a ton of my time being a fire prevention method mm-hmm. rather than a firefighter. Mm-hmm. I don't want to fight fires. Mm-hmm. I don't want to have to deal with them because they take a whole lot of effort. Mm-hmm. And then even when you put it out, you have nothing but a pile of smoldering ashes, mm-hmm. right? You do, probably didn't save it. You just put the fire right. out from spreading and burning something else. Right. So I want to be in fire prevention mode as much as possible. Mm-hmm. And then I want to surround myself with people, whether they be full-time employees on our teams or just people we partner with on projects or people who are just friends mm-hmm. that need some help or I need some help. Mm-hmm. You know, I spend a lot of my time trying to call my mentors and say, Hey, I got this going on. What should right. I, what do you think? Right. You know? And so I think that's it for me. Find the highest and best use of my time and focus on those things. And if I do that, hopefully it's the things I'm passionate about. Right. right? So if I'm not passionate about it, I'm going to get into a grind. I'm not going to persevere. 
the task list is going to get longer. You know, I'm not knocking stuff off my list because mm-hmm. uh, I'm just bogged down in something. And sometimes that happens. Do you keep a daily? Do you keep do you keep a daily list? Do you keep a yeah? Like well, it's a, like an ongoing okay. list. It's okay. not so much daily because um, I just never know how much time I'll have mm-hmm. for each of these things. And sometimes, you know, my list tends to get longer rather than shorter. Mm-hmm. Like I can knock three things off my list and add five. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's really just an ongoing list, and then it's taking that list and figuring out what can I do to be more effective with my time and passing it off to other people. The other thing that helps me with my list is when I'm working on things I'm passionate about, it doesn't feel like work. Right. Mm-hmm. So when I'm sitting in front of the TV, I'm going, you know, I'm, I'm not even paying attention to what's on. Right. My wife's watching something or my kids are watching something, you know, and so I can knock out a ton of work at right. night or on the weekends because it doesn't feel like work when I'm doing the things I'm passionate about. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. if I'm catching up with friends or shooting emails or uh, creating new ideas, I mean, sometimes, you know, some of the best ideas come from not, you know, doing what you're supposed to be doing, mm-hmm. you know, and something comes out of that concept. And that's where a lot of what we work on now comes from is just like this hybridization. So one of my mentors is this guy named Dr. Jim Brennan, and he's one of the world's leading experts in human performance. And uh, he's just a brilliant guy, but he's also one of the kindest guys I've ever met. And one of the first times we were spending time together, he just kind of, we've been together like 30 minutes. And he said, Scott, he said, I don't know if you understand how your brain works. I was like, I do not understand mm-hmm. what's going. This is what's going on in this popcorn machine up here. Right. You know, I know the kernels are always cooking, and there's always popcorn going on. But no, I don't. And he said, Well, one of your unique skills is that you're able to take unrelated concepts and then find ways to put them together to create new things. Mm-hmm. And I thought, That's the way my brain works. I'd never had anybody explain it to me before, mm-hmm. and I didn't have an internal dialogue mm-hmm. to understand that that right. framework. Right. But within 30 minutes, he's so good at this. I mean, he does work for you know, the UN and the United War mm-hmm. Nations and the Google. U.S. Naval War College, Google, you know, those kind of guys. Right. Um, but it just struck me, like, mm-hmm. yeah, that's what I do. Like, mm-hmm. that's kind of my one of my superpowers, you know. Mm-hmm. We've all got our own, um, you know, paying the bills when they're due is not on my list. You right. know, if it's, like, right. task-oriented, I'm not good at that. My brain's right. not built for that. And so, you know, then I, I now spend time trying to think on that. What are unrelated things? that Mm -hmm. can be put together to create new things. So we're not actually creating new things. We're just putting them together in a different way. Remember that uh, cartoon from the 80s, Voltron, Mm -hmm. right? Or, you know, the Thundercats and all those kind of things. It's like those kind of things. You put them all together and you create something new. Exactly. Going real to Johnny probably remembers some of that stuff. He's older than us. (laughs) Talk a little, I don't remember the 80s. Uh, Talk a little bit about, um, on a more in-depth level, some of the things that you're doing now, some projects you're working on, things like that. Yeah, one of the things that we love doing, and I'm super passionate about this right now, and almost all my time is going into this, and it's the concept of creating better leaders and better teammates. And it's a lot of what I do is for me, Mm. right? It's like, how do I learn how to do this? And if I can learn it, then we need to share it with other people. And and if anybody follows me on social media, they say, oh, you're like the most optimistic and positive person I've ever seen. It's like, that's because that's what I need, right? right? And I'm trying to fill myself with that every day mm-hmm. to, to stay relentlessly optimistic as we talk about. A lot so, of the things I post in, in terms of business advice, insurance advice, social media marketing is actually for me. Right. It's, it's like I'm struggling with that, so I'm going to then put that out there right. to, to, you know, if I put out there and say, hey, don't do A, B, and C, I'm telling myself that, well, because I've put that out to the world, yeah. then that's holding, then the world is now holding me accountable. That's right. 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 And yep. so, and I've heard a lot of other people say that as well. Well, you can't build a brand on kindness and relentless optimism and then not try and be that. Exactly. I mean, you're going to make mistakes. Right. You, you right. know, like we, I, I get frustrated like anybody and I get down like anybody. Mm-hmm. Sometimes, you know, the way this brain of mine works and for other entrepreneurs as well. It's like, it's a roller coaster. We have really high highs and really low lows. Mm -hmm. And the trick is how do we kind of modulate that and stay focused and stay centered as much as possible. And we live in a world too, where people like to call party foul. Oh, very fast. fast. Super fast. And so if you're the guy that's promoting kindness and then of course everybody's going to be human and they have a down moment, then people in in 2019, 2020 are real quick to say, Oh, wait a minute. You know? And, And I think when those things happen, just got to own up to it, if mm-hmm. you know, and be like, yeah, man, that was not good. Well, we, I, I don't we, want to do that. We had a podcast guest uh, back last year. Bradley will remember this. He was going to do a he was going to do 180 videos in 180 days. Do you yeah. remember that? That's uh, uh, Mike Crowley. Crowley, and he, but he before he did it, he published it all over social media, 
for the exact reason you just mentioned, mm-hmm. it was it was to create accountability for him to have to do it. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's right. So, that's important. Yeah. Yeah, so we spend a lot of time trying to think about how to build better leaders and better teammates. And so whether that's stuff that we're producing ourselves or whether that's clients that we're, we're helping do that. And so we're trying to run the spectrum. So we've got this concept uh, for a preschool uh, that's not been implemented yet, but we've got a really good plan on that. And so then we go into elementary schools and say, if we, if we can start there, the, the foundation, mm-hmm. we've got a really good chance for better leaders and teammates. So we partnered up with this group called The Voyage for Schools, and they have an online character education program. And the really cool thing is it's a 30-week program per year, and they take these 32 key concepts, what they call anchors in character education, and they go through this with the school. And because it's online, it's easy to implement. It's also super cheap. But what we've started to do and how we got involved is um, Dan Cathy, who's the CEO of Chick-fil-A, basically underwrote this program being developed. Mm -hmm. So because of that— Wasn't this his passion project? It was for his grandkids. Yeah. Yeah, he wanted his grandkids to have something like this. Mm Because we'll talk about the high school product, the Chick-fil-A Leaders Academy, which was created first. But Mm -hmm. he wanted something like this for his grandkids. And it went so well that all the other teachers and principals were like, how do we get a hold of this, too? Right. Well, one person can't necessarily underwrite this across the entire country. Mm So kind of what we got involved was they, they knew I was a former teacher. So that's, you know, in the long story of things I've done, I always wanted to be a teacher and a coach right. because the teachers and the coaches were the mentors in my life. I almost failed out of high school multiple times, um, had multiple teachers basically drag me back in mm-hmm. uh, to keep me from failing out. And then even in college, made a 0.0 GPA one semester. Strong. I just couldn't, couldn't, yeah, I mean, they called the buckshot around here, that's you know. That's it, that's uh, it. <laughs> the double lot. And so... Mr. Dublarski, 0.0. <laughs> uh, man, it was crazy. And so... I knew I wanted to be a teacher and a coach, right? And I did right. that for a while before I became an attorney. But so I'm super passionate about education, and and this was a good opportunity. So we partnered up with those guys. And so what we do is um, they're able to provide this program for super cheap, sometimes it's like $10 per student per year, which wow. a fraction of the cost, right? The average school has like 350 kids. So, you know, you're looking at like 3500 bucks. That's, mm. that's not a lot. But it is a lot when you're going to a school system that's got right. 40 schools. Right. And they get, they say, yeah, I know that's not much per kid, but we've got 60,000 students. Mm-hmm. You're asking for $600,000 a year, and we can't really justify that right now. So what we try to do is flip that model on its head, and we, we spun it around. And we said, what if we went direct to each elementary school that wanted this, and we were able to go and find people who wanted to underwrite that for their community? Mm-hmm. And so that's important for us because now similar to sponsoring the ball team. Yeah, or, or but even like, better, yeah. right? So when you sponsor a ball team, that's good, right? But we call it community investment marketing. We've got this whole kind of framework that we built out that we try and work mm-hmm. with our clients on because mm-hmm. um, we do some of this for corporate training. See, if you invest your marketing dollars in community investment marketing, I can't guarantee you an ROI. I can't put a code on that. I can't. Uh, I can't mm-hmm. put the metrics like I can a Facebook ad or some mm-hmm. digital stuff. But if you do it authentically, if right. you start with this authentic concept of there are it, problems in my community and intent. I want to solve them. That's right. Authentically, you have to have the right intent. Mm-hmm. If you do that and you do it intentionally, persistently, and consistently, then the community will recognize that and it's our belief that you will get more business. Right. Mm-hmm. If you're intentional and purposeful, mm. consistent and persistent, and doing it for the right reasons, mm-hmm. then we mm-hmm. think you will get a return. And if you don't, when is it still the right thing to do anyway? Right, right. You know, so... And as long as the intent's there, even if you don't get an immediate return with things like that, as long as the intent's there, you, you're going to get something out of it, absolutely. even if it's just goodwill in the community. Well, and I think who makes... You know, let's talk about it in the insurance model. Mm-hmm. You know, who's making the decision most of the time? Moms, right? Right. Who's the one getting the backpack when it comes home from school? Moms. Mom. Mm-hmm. Who's every, every week this... This, uh, you know, paperwork from the Voyage for Schools is coming home in your kid's backpack. Well, where's this program? Where'd that come from? With the oh, business, you know, the local business person's information yeah. on it. So, yeah. yeah, Mr. Such and Such uh, mm-hmm. provided this for our school. Wow, why would he do that? Because it's the right thing to do. Yeah. All right, mm-hmm. so now you start to think about that. And you go, all right, we break that model down. Now we're providing this wonderful thing for elementary school students, right? K through five. And so the things that I love about the Voyage as a former teacher is it has shown a increase in academic performance. It has shown a decrease in office referrals, and it has shown a decrease in instances of bullying. And this is important because most anti-bullying programs are don't do bad stuff. Mm-hmm. Don't do bad stuff. This is be a great person, be kind, be responsible, have gratitude. Hey, Johnny, that was a great job of showing gratitude today. 
oh, wait, thanks for the positive reinforcement, right? right? But it's And it's consistent and persistent. So when it's a 30-week program per year, you start this in kindergarten. By the time you're in fifth grade, you know, and each grade is getting dosed lessons that make sense for their grade, right? It's not one size fits all. Then you move into middle school, and hopefully you've laid that foundation. So the guys that developed this program, ADO, ADDO, they're based out of Atlanta. They're great guys, just tremendous humans. And they're working on a middle school product, which will be cool because that's going to bridge what we go into next, Mm -hmm. which is uh, they created the Chick-fil-A Leaders Academy. Mm -hmm. So the Chick-fil-A Leaders Academy is in over 900 schools in over 40 states now. And they're creating this tremendous leadership opportunity. And that's important, right? So, and we're helping them on that. We want to get this into more high schools, right? right. Uh, but that's a little different model. That's the Chick Fil A operator decides that they want to do that. Right. But if there's anybody in this listening to this that looks at your high school and you don't have this in your current high school, right. it's easy. We we got to go to your Chick Fil A operator and say, hey, let's put this in the schools. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's not something hard. And the operators may or may not even know about it. Most of them probably should by now. Right. But. It can be something that's really transformative, and it doesn't have to just be one school, right? So I was talking to the same thing with the elementary schools. I was talking to a guy uh, in New York. Actually, we were all together, right, right. up in New York. I was talking to a guy, and we were talking about this, and he was a, he's in the insurance world. You know, He said, well, how much would it be for my elementary school? So I just looked it up, how many students were in his elementary school, and I said, it's going to be like 2800 bucks." And he was like, hmm, a month? Yeah, I guess I could do that. And I was like, no, dude, just a year. And he was like, wait, <laughs> a year? You know, because if you're in, in the big city, right, that marketing right. budget looks a lot different than if right. you're somewhere else, sure, right? Sure, sure. Um, but there's options out there. And so he said, well, I need to go back to the office and talk to the people that work in my office and find out where their kids go to elementary school. Right. You know, because then you're expanding your reach. So you don't have to just limit yourself to one. But if you can be that person in your community, and, and it's not just about the voyage. The voyage is a way. But how do you be intentional? How do you say, like, all right, if, if we're looking at a... Uh, we're trying to create hot leads, right? Everybody wants hot leads, right? The cold leads are really tough to close. Right. Our conversion rate's probably super low. Warm leads are better. Hot leads, I got a pretty good chance. Mm-hmm. I mean, the way I want to create hot leads is by becoming this person in the community that people go, man, he's such a nice guy. Like, I want to take my marketing dollars and go, you know, I'm going to put some here. Some, it's like an investment portfolio, right? right? I mean, you're putting some in different places. But I think there has to be a vertical that says, I'm going to send a cookie cake to the first grade teachers at my elementary school. Why first grade? I don't care. Pick second grade, but pick a group of teachers because these people all spend all day, every day together. Mm -hmm. And then they're going to be the influence on the other people. If you did one teacher from first grade and one teacher from fifth grade, that's not the same kind of power, right? Mm Because they're not within that same little core group of people. Right. But, you know, another example, like, let's say we all get hit up all the time by schools, right? Hey, we're trying to raise $500 for the volleyball team. My, My answer is, what is the money for? Because I want to figure out what the solution is, right? So if the solution is, uh, oh, we need to get, you know, uniforms. Uniforms. Right. Okay, let's take that. Or we need gas to travel or whatever. What if you could broker some leverage and you could go to Dick's because you're a business person and you understand how business works, and you go to Dick's and say, say, look, we're trying to get new uniforms. Uh, I we will, you know, I'll buy five hundred dollars worth of Dick's gift cards if you'll throw in an extra $50 gift card Mm. or something like that. Now I've increased it by 10%. But what I want to do then is I want to actually get those in smaller denominations because I want to give these gift cards to the individual students and say like, here's a, here's for your uniform. Here's for your uniform. Cause then they're going to go home to mom and they're going to say, do you know that Mr. Tyndall gave me this gift card? It doesn't have to come from me, but the coach can do the giving, you know, say Mr. Tyndall gave us this because he wanted us to have this better Mm. opportunity. Mm. Right. When you just give the money directly into the giant pool, then this doesn't necessarily have the same mm-hmm. impact. Mm-hmm. You're still doing the right thing for the right reasons, but you want to show them that you care about them. Because when you give money to the volleyball team, you're not doing it because you want business. Sometimes you're doing it because you want them to stop asking you to bother you, right? right, right. That's not the right intent either. We don't want to give with mm-hmm. the wrong intent. But I want to give with the intent of building relationships. Mm-hmm. You know, I want I want mom and dad to want to build a relationship with me, mm-hmm. to want to you know, do that. And if I'm doing it with the right intent, then, then that's good. But you think about like, then these teachers, these parents become those people that, you know, want to be advocates for you. Mm -hmm. You know, I tell people that saying nice things about yourself is called advertising. We all do it. Hey, I'm the best insurance agent Mm and, you know, Spokane, Washington, let me help you. You know, I'm going to be, I'm going to do good things for you. Okay. That's good. Right. We got to advertise. But when other people say nice things about us, it means something totally different. Right. And that's where our reviews come in, right? Right. Like, we want people to leave reviews um, 
and we kind of generated this concept that if we can get them to leave great reviews for us, I don't want a four-star review. I only want five-star reviews because if I didn't do a five-star experience for you, I want you to call me mm-hmm. and figure out what I did wrong. Right. Because if I did, if I got a four-star review, I didn't do, I didn't exceed your expectations. Mm-hmm. I didn't do everything I needed to do. And so if you tell people like, I don't want you to leave a four-star review. Mm-hmm. I want you to leave a five-star review. And if I didn't give you a five-star experience, I want you to call me and here's my phone number. And literally put your phone number on the internet mm-hmm. because 90% of the time, they'll never call you. Right. The ten percent of the time they'll call and apologize. Right. Say you know because you're you're being authentic about I I did not do you the best I could. Right. You know and if it, you ever have trolls on the internet it's the same thing I learned that from David Meltzer who's one of my, my mentors now. Yeah. It's like if somebody trolls him on the internet, he's got hundreds of thousands of followers. If somebody trolls him on the internet, he literally says, "I'm sorry you feel that way. I don't know what I did to disappoint you. Here's my cell phone. Please call me so we can discuss it." Right. And he says, you know, ninety percent of the time nobody ever calls. Mm-hmm. The other ten percent of the time they call apologizing like I'm really sorry for blowing you up like that. Right. Like people don't realize you're a real person. Right. Right. You're, you're, we're real people. And sometimes we get these personas, but you know, so if agents uh, listening to this or anyone listening to this carrier, even, you know, wanted to get involved in that program, how would they go about doing that? Because I think it sounds like something that's right up an insurance agent's alley. Yeah, I think, it, I think it really is. I think insurance agents specifically can really benefit from this program, and I know your communities and your elementary schools will benefit from it. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll get the information that you can put it in the show notes. Okay. You know, yeah. um, They can hit me up on any of my social channels. I'm Scott Tindall on all the different channels. Or um, reach out to us. Or reach out to you Scott directly. and I are really yeah. good friends, so reach yeah. out to us. We can actually, send that your way. I actually spent some time on the site last night, and, mm-hmm. and I have the web address here. It's www. If this is – correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. The voy- www.thevoyage for schools with an S on the end of school.com. That's correct. Yeah, the and, voyage for schools.com. And, and, and it, is a, it is a character development program. Um, I absolutely love it. It's something that my wife taught second grade for 14 years and then art for another five. Yeah. And something that we're, we're very interested in as well. But I want to I want to kind of move off of that for one second and talk a little bit about some things that we talked about in there before before we came in here. Uh, number one, you mentioned the word gratitude, mm-hmm. and then you started expanding on each letter of the yeah. word gratitude. And I, I can't remember exactly in what context. I think we were talking about internal dialogue, yeah. success uh, formulas. Yeah, 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 exactly, success formulas. Talk a little bit about that, though. Yeah, so uh, we've created this concept now that we call Grit Leadership, and it's um, we do everything from large events uh, around the country. We're doing events in Atlanta, Denver, Houston, San Diego, Mobile, and Miami, um, but we also do corporate training. But th- the concept is this. Um, everybody needs a success formula, okay? Mm-hmm. You need a personal one, and you need a corporate success formula. We all talk about our goals and our visions and our objectives. We don't have a roadmap on how we're going to get there, mm-hmm. and so – it's kind of like your compass, right? right? So my personal success formula um, is grit, kindness, and relentless optimism. Because if I can focus on those things, I'm increasing my chances of success. Mm-hmm. So we say grit is that unique combination of passion and perseverance, right? We talked about being passionate about it, persevering. Kindness, because if I choose the kindest option, and there are always more than one option available to me, mm-hmm. even if it's shutting my mouth, right? Mm-hmm. Not talking is an option. Right. Um, that's a decision. Not making the decision is a decision. Um, if I can focus on kindness, I think it gives me the best odds of success in a given outcome. I can have a better chance of a successful outcome. Mm-hmm. And then we say relentless optimism because it's not enough to be optimistic. We know neuroscience teaches us that when you're positive and optimistic, your brain works more efficiently and you're more productive. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, bad things are going to happen today. I promise you, whether it's you're stuck in traffic or things much worse, mm-hmm. right? You're having trouble with business or in a personal relationship. If we stay relentlessly optimistic, the minute we get in a negative mind state, we're, we're able to then neutralize ourselves, get back to center, and then from center, get back in a positive state. You can't go from negative to positive right. without stopping in the middle. Right. I mean, that doesn't happen. And, and we talk a lot about this when we're doing corporate training on guest service stuff. And we've spent a lot of time in the hospitality and tourism business, you know, from the stuff we created. And we learned that. Like, you cannot take a, someone from a negative guest experience to a positive one without stopping them in the middle. Right. And sometimes that's not in the same day. Mm-hmm. Right. Sometimes I just got to get you to neutral, let you cool off. And then the next experience I have with you, I can move you from neutral to positive. Sure. But what I can't do is leave you in a negative experience. I got to neutralize that first. Mm-hmm. And then because sometimes people just don't want to hear the good stuff. Right. Mm-hmm. I just want to get you calm down. Mm-hmm. And it's bad to say sometimes calm down. Sometimes you're just in such a bad, you don't want, yeah, you don't want, you, nope, you just, it's not going to work. Um, 
And so that's why we say you got to be relentlessly optimistic. So that's my personal formula. And our theory on this is your personal formula then impacts your corporate formula. If you're leading the office, if you're leading a team, um, whatever your personality is transfers through your team, mm. right? So we had this conversation as well. It's like, so if you're talking to an, if we were talking to an insurance agent and they say, well, one of the things I really need help with is retention of my employees, you know, such and such down the street, you know, they've had the same employees for 10 years. And I'm turning over employees every six months. Right. So, all right, well, what we need to work on is you. Right. It's not a corporate thing. This is a you thing because mm. people don't typically quit their jobs. They quit their boss. So if you have a retention problem like that, doesn't mean that, that we're doing anything wrong necessarily. You may be selecting people who don't fit what you do. Right. Right. You've got to find the right people that are the right fit. Yeah. I'm not saying you're a bad person. I don't know if you're a good or bad person. We just got to evaluate what you're, you know, have you ever developed a corporate formula or a corporate, corporate philosophy? Mm -hmm. No. Do you have a success formula? No. Okay. So when you're adding people in, you don't know if they're the right fit for that or not. Right. I know when, when I go to add somebody to my team, they're real certain about what our mm -hmm. corporate philosophy is. And if they don't like that, or if they are a cynic, they self-select themselves out, which right. is great because then I don't have to worry about training them mm -hmm. and you know then them leaving and that stuff. So you gotta, it's all about the selection and vetting. And we say, it's not about hiring, it is about selecting. It's about selecting people into this team that fit your corporate formula. So we took that grit, kindness, and relentless optimism, and we moved that over for the corporate side kept that same philosophy, but we said it's got to go deeper. So we took grit and turned it into an acronym. So that acronym becomes gratitude because we say if we're not thankful for what we have now, we won't be thankful for the blessings that come. We just can't. We'll always be chasing the next thing. Mm -hmm. And we say relationships because we say everything should be relational. Nothing should be transactional. Mm. That's where we want to start. We want to start Agents, with these relationships. write this shit down. It goes back to like the community investment marketing. Yep, if right. you're doing that for a transactional purpose, people will see through that, right, and it's right. not going to be successful. Absolutely. But if you're doing it to, because it's the right thing for the people in your community, and I tell people, they're like, well, how do I know what my community needs? Ask them. Get on social media and say, what are the needs of our community? I can't solve all of them, but this week we're going to pick one, and right. we're going to try well, and solve it. It's right. like, it's like, and I'll let you finish, uh, Agent 2021 this year. Gary was on stage, and, of course, Agent 2021 is predominantly real estate agents, and that was kind of where his message was honed in on, but it can be applied. And he said, I said this last year, and I'm still waiting on somebody to do it. Post on Facebook as a real estate agent and say, what is the wor where is the worst pothole in such and such town? Yeah. Go, bag a go buy a bag of Quickcrete. Go grab a videographer. Yeah. Go down to that street and have them video you filling that pothole. Yeah. It makes a difference. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's this whole concept. Be intentional and, and purposeful. So if, if potholes aren't your thing, find the next thing. But ask your community what they need, and they be, say, we can't solve all the community's problems. Mm -hmm. And we understand that. But that doesn't mean we're not going to try starting to knock some stuff off mm -hmm. the list. Right. And use part of your marketing budget as that. Don't say, like, be budget neutral on this thing if you want. You mm -hmm. don't have to necessarily have to come out of pocket yeah. because we're not – most of us are not very efficient with our marketing budgets anyway. Mm -hmm. we, we're spending money. We don't know if we're getting results or not. I can track some stuff online. I don't know one person that is. But you know what I mean? We're not. So if we, if we know that we've got some margin where we're not necessarily being able to track it, why not pour it into the community? Right. And I'm also still not going to be able to track it, by the way. Right. Or I might at least get, you know, anecdotal mm -hmm. evidence of, oh, well, the reason I chose to do this is because of this, you know. Um, but if you're doing it for the right reasons, you're actually solving problems in your community. You'll be seen as a problem solver. Mm -hmm. And then when somebody has an insurance problem or whatever other business you're in, mm -hmm. well, I mean, Scott and Bradley, they're, I mean, they're problem solvers. So right. I'm sure they can help me solve this problem, too. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah. ask the community what they need. Ask yeah. them what they need. Yeah. What are the problems here? And you, your inbox will be flooded. You mm -hmm. don't have to worry about finding opportunities. you got to figure out which ones you can break off and, and handle. Mm -hmm. So it's like this, that old expression, how to eat a dinosaur. Right. right? One bite, bite at a time. time. Right. Yeah, you can't solve all the problems. Mm -hmm. But if I go, oh, look, I can. here's a $30 problem I can solve. And it mm -hmm. may be something small. Mm -hmm. And then start doing things that are, are nice for people just to do it, right, mm -hmm. As out of gratitude. Right. Hey, when we talk about sending a cookie cake to teachers, why? Because we're thankful you're so sweet to, to our children in our community. Oh. So, so you don't want anything back? No, I just want to thank you for being so sweet. Right. What does a cookie cake cost? 20 bucks? Yeah. And if we, if we can find 20 bucks in our marketing budgets to do stuff like that. So you've got to the R in gratitude. Yeah. So R is relationships, right? Right. Everything's relational, nothing's transactional. Uh, we say I. Um, I is about innovation. So we got G-R-I-T, right? Gratitude, relationships. Now, I is innovation because 
we say that creativity is thinking new things, but innovation is doing new things. Mm. It's not enough just to talk. We don't, we've done a lot of talking right now, right? We're getting creative. Right. That's not innovation. Mm -hmm. Innovation is when we actually go do the things that we're talking about. Rewards come from action. Because if we don't do them, it doesn't matter, right? Mm -hmm. I, I know plenty of people that have notebooks full of, of things that I, I'm going to do. Just pick one and do it, right. right? I'm not saying break up, don't eat the whole dinosaur. Right. Just pick off one thing right now. Even if it's the, if you've got kids, just do it for the teacher of your kids. Right. Just send them a $10 iTunes gift card. Mm -hmm. Why? Just because. Why not? They spend all day with your kids. Right. I mean, that's why this education model makes sense for me. Is like, these are the people that are raising my children. Mm -hmm. You know, we're on summer break right now, but when we're in school and I'm at work all day, my wife's at work all day. These teachers are raising my kids. Right. I need to be pouring into them and be thankful for them and show them gratitude, mm -hmm. you know? But it's about doing those things. And so then the last one is teamwork. And it goes back to the self-awareness. Build a diversity of teammates. Because mm -hmm. what I say, if we were all just alike, we wouldn't need each other. It's really easy, though, for us to just want to hire people who are just like me because I vibe with them, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I don't need to vibe with them on the way we accomplish work. I need to vibe with them on this corporate formula. Right. I need that's your the vibe. That's the vibe I need and all that. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And and ours is not for everybody. But what I say is and when we do our corporate trainings is we walk walk people through the process. Mm -hmm. How do I do this? How do I establish this? Well, let's just walk through the concept. Right. And then sit down and say, "All right." And then you if you've got your team there, well, first of all, you got to start with your success formula. But you look at your team and go, "What do we believe in?" And sometimes you don't like the answers, mm -hmm. and that's okay because then you go do we want to be? Do we want to be this, or do we want to be something different? Because we can always be something different. It's never too late to change. Now it's an incremental process. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't change from. You know, I can't get in shape and run a triathlon tomorrow. Right. But if I can be consistent and persistent in the pursuit of the best version of myself, eventually I am moving toward that goal. And you, you, you talking about being kind. Sometimes you got to be kind to yourself. Right. Right. We can be our own biggest critics, and we will beat ourselves up. Mm -hmm. And I found. My experience has been the smarter someone is, the more likely they are to beat themselves up. Mm -hmm. You know, I was talking to a guy the other day and he was like, well, can you help me do training? I'm, I'm not a good leader. And I said, honestly, you're a better leader than you think you are. And I know that because the question you're asking. Right. He's like, what do you mean? I said, bad leaders don't realize they're yeah, bad they leaders. Yeah, they the fact that, that you've got the self-awareness, right. that tells me that you're interested in becoming a better leader. But I already know you're not a bad leader, mm -hmm. so let's start a baseline on that. Right. And for one, he felt really good because he he had been beating himself up, right? Because that's what we do. Because he's a super intelligent guy. Well, why do why do people? And, and you know, I've always said something about you that you have a doctoral degree in human behavior through through the the school of of life, right? Yeah, hard knocks, man. Yeah, yeah. Why do people create uh, as it relates to themselves and sometimes others? And, and what I mean by others is other employees that are part of their organization. Mm -hmm. why, why do they seem to create a false narrative like that? I think we're insecure. Is that what it is? I think so. I mean, none of us want to be, we all, we all want to be seen as the best version of ourselves, right? Where we all want to, we all aspire to be something. Mm -hmm. um, insecurities can drive us to doing things that sometimes are outside of our, our personality. Mm -hmm. um, but what I know is a lot of times... So you're saying insecurity is what caused this young man to come to you and say, hey, I'm a bad leader. Yeah, he's insecure about his leadership skills. Yeah. Um, even though he's better than he thinks he is, mm -hmm. right? But he's also super intelligent, which allows him to be hypercritical of himself. Uh -huh. um, people who are not as intelligent, they don't understand the complexities of it. The smarter you are, the more complex you understand the world mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. And then you go, I don't know anything. It's like right. the more you learn about a topic, you the go, you know. I don't know anything about <laughs> right, this topic. Right, right. As opposed to people who are just super happy being what I call cocktail party dangerous. Right. Hey, I read about this on the internet. I can carry yeah. on. I can carry on a conversation about oh, this. I, have buddies I am that way about a lot of things. So what? <laughs> what I've started doing, yeah, I am too. So what I've started doing is like, it, I just sit it out. Like if I don't right. know enough, I just right. sit it out. I'm like man, I, can, whew, I better learn something on that because yeah, I right. don't know. Right. It's like I'm not a neuroscientist, but I've studied it a lot. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm not a human behavioralist, but I don't have a degree in those things. But I've studied it a lot. Yeah. Now accounting? No. If we start having a, accounting conversations about you know the best types of accounting, and I'm sitting that one out. Right. Mm -hmm. But that's right. also having self awareness, right? Right. So we don't have to have an opinion on everything. Sometimes it's okay to say I don't have enough information to have an yeah. opinion. Yeah. Talk a little bit about uh, the Grit Leadership Series, just because I know uh, we've got a lot of agents in some of the cities where that's going to be happening. Yeah, and I want to give those guys an opportunity to man. I think those guys I, and gals to have an opportunity. I am super that. pumped about this. You talk about something you're passionate about, like 
you know, and this concept came out of this thing that Bradley and I kind of formulated together, you know, back in the fall. And we, we did a pilot event in January. And so what we've done now is we've, we've created the Grit Leadership Series. It's about bu- building better leaders and better teammates through gratitude, relationships, innovation, and teamwork. And what we've done is we've taken leaders from sports, business, entertainment, innovation, and we've created these panels where we can all go learn from them. And it's about a day and a half. Um, we start the night before with what we call a networking pre-party where people can get to know each other. They can get to know the speakers. And we find that sets a really good foundation for what we're doing. The next morning we have like kind of a little – uh, breakfast for you know our special guests and speakers and you know you can get access to those through the ticket packages but the big main event is uh, from 8 30 to 1 and it's not, how do we build better leaders and teammates what we found is if somebody down the hall says something to you if they've been your manager for five years mm-hmm. you kind of have tuned them out over the years right but if an nfl hall of famer says it, if champ bailey says it from the stage you know i'm champ bailey i mean he made the hall of fame he must know what he's talking about you know if dave Meltzer, who's one of the world's leading business experts says it from the stage you go, well, I mean, Meltzer said it, so, I mean, he probably knows what he's talking about. Your manager's like, I've been telling you that for five years. <laughs> yeah, but you're not in the Hall of Fame, my, right. you know? That's my dad. So, <laughs> yeah, so we just tune him out, and that's just human nature, too. We understand that. Right. So, yeah. But what we try and say is it'll be the most fun you've ever had a professional development experience. I mean, we, our host is a guy named Jesse Cole from the Savannah Bananas. He runs around in a yellow tuxedo. we got a DJ on stage. I mean, it's just really a lot of fun. Yep. And what we hope is it inspires these ideas, uh-huh. and you learn how to be a better leader and better teammate. But... We hope that you go and actually implement this stuff in your offices, mm-hmm. right? So we encourage people to come as teams. Like coming by yourself is really hard to then go back to your office and be like, "Let me tell you about what I saw today." Because the Bring rest of the team, team yeah. yeah, the rest of your team is like, mm, "What?" Yeah. Like, what are you talking about? Right. Well, yep. if you bring everybody together, then you experience this together. Right. You know, that's why the name of our company that produces this is called Experiential Design Group. We uh-huh. we design these experiences, so it's going to be super fun. So we're in Atlanta, September twenty fifth, and uh, kind of the big thing there would be we'll have Champ Bailey. And Dave Meltzer doing a live version of his uh, podcast called The Playbook. So mm-hmm. if any, anybody's familiar with Entrepreneur Magazine, Meltzer's got a, a podcast called The Playbook. Dave Meltzer will be on Ask Gary V. A yes. Week from tomorrow. It's coming up. Yeah, he's doing an Ask yeah. Gary V this summer. He's, he's got a book come he's, out. He's a heavy hitter. His book came out super big to, today, the, today. The day we're recording it. So uh, and it went to number one on Amazon. Forbes named it the best mm-hmm. business book of the summer. Yeah. Um, and it's and interesting with this whole cool thing, guy. man. Is like you and I went to lunch, went to breakfast. And we're just talking like ideas. And I'm like, man, let me tell you about this idea I had one time. And we just started shoot like it literally like we had no and it turned into Mobile, which then led you to get this idea of, hey, let's do this all over the country. You know? Yeah. It, it was it's crazy how that works. Um and that but it goes back to what did we do, right? We thought about it right. and then we did it, right? We put it in, you know, Bradley and his team and my team put on the first event in like sixty days. Right. We didn't say like, oh, we only have sixty days. Mm-hmm. We said, hey, we got sixty days. Right, right. Let's get this thing done. Knock it out. So, you know? so, so going back, I want to go back to something you said earlier that I want to get some clarification on. When you talked about your personal success formula and being optimistic, yeah, what was the term you used about relentlessly, optimistic. relentlessly optimistic? Right. So you're relentlessly optimistic during the day. You're an insurance agent. You're one of the two hundred fifty thousand listening to this, yep. and then. One o'clock rolls around, and you get the call, okay? And it's some client that's pissed off because their billing account got messed up or a a, 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 a horrible claim situation, whatever the case may be. How how does Scott Tyndall, and I'm, I'm just trying to climb inside that very large brain of yours and figure out, you're relentlessly optimistic, you get the call. How do you get yourself back on track? So the first thing I've got to do is I know that I'm off track, right? Yeah. So what I like to say is if when we're dealing with through, clients through self awareness. Self awareness, right. So it's, it's, it's mindfulness, right? Pissed so off, bad mood. Yeah, it's mindfulness. It's this yeah. idea of um, the concept of mindfulness is I'm not whatever this thought is. Mm-hmm. This is a thought. Right. So I don't say I am anxious. Mm-hmm. I say I want to be mindful and say I am feeling anxiety. Because that doesn't define me. Say I'm, it out I'm, loud to I, yourself. Yeah, like I literally will sit down and say I'm feeling anxiety. And then I go, Why am why am I feeling anxiety? And then I can identify what that is, and then I can figure out if I can solve it or not. Right. If I can't solve it, I got to let it go. If I can't solve it, I need to put it in action. But if I can't solve it, I got to let it go. We, we try and say, but that's spend, easier said than done. It's very easy. I mean, it, it's much easier to say than it is to yeah, do. Right. But it's a it's a process of training yourself. You say, I need to spend as much of my time worrying about things I can control. Right. And not worrying about things I cannot control. If I cannot control them, 
using that mental capacity on that is not going to be helpful. But it's a process. You don't do this in one day, by the let, way. Let me and st- I still work on this all day, every day. Well, let, let me stop you right there because this speaks to insurance agents from around the world. One of the things I've started doing is I will have clients call me about a claim, claim situation is a perfect example. Right. Well, what if this happens or what if that happens? Mm-hmm. And I will, I will say to them, let's control what we can control and not worry right now about what may or may not happen. Right. And, and because sometimes they want to go off on this tangent of, well, what if this and what if that? Right. And if you can get them back to mm-hmm. here's where we are, let's talk about where we are. Right. And not worry about what's going to happen just well, yet. And then it's Until about, it happens. Then it's about what are the things we're doing to create the odds to give us the best successful outcomes. Right. Let's talk about the decisions we make. It's like gaming a blackjack table. That's right. You, let's you let's look. Let's make decisions cards. based on the odds that we have. Right. And sometimes that's not playing the hand. Right. Right. It's sitting this out, not yep. not doubling down on it. Right. Sometimes you can have a really great hand, double down, triple down, and you still lose. Right. Was it the right decision? If you tell me I got a ninety five percent chance to triple my money, I'm playing that hand. Right. I also know that five times out of 100, I'm going to lose. Right. But it was still the right decision to make. Mm-hmm. Right. So we talk to our clients about it's not about results based, based decision making. It's about mm-hmm. odds based decision making. Right. If you ask 100 people what's the best decision you made all year, they're going to give you the best result. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily mean it was the right decision or the best decision. Right. Because it's about playing the odds. Um, and, and, and I'm about to blow everybody's mind that's listening to this podcast right now. What you just said. Bradley, you need to hear this. What you just said relative to my example of playing blackjack and playing the odds of, of positivity versus negative t- negativity can also be translated into the decision that you make as an insurance agent out of the gate, depending on which company, carrier, direction you choose to take your company in or, or, or what you choose to do from the start. In right. other words, depending on what decision you make as to where you go and which agency you go with and what type of agency you have is probably from a long-term perspective, certain decisions would probably give you a better chance of being successful while others may not. Yeah, I'm sure uh, these does companies... That, does that yeah, make sense? Absolutely. These companies are all going to have their own framework, their own rules, their own, own kind of guidance. And absolutely. you got to find the one that fits your personality um, rather than trying to shoehorn yourself into something that may not work for you right. one way or the other. And you know, I'm not here to tell anybody how that how oh, to make those decisions. I, I'm not either. But, I'm just saying... But I you've got to examine those things. Yeah, I think certain... I think those decisions on the front end. Yeah, Bradley's a perfect example. You could, you, you dude, you could have got, you had, you probably could have had a hundred different choices when you left where you were to start your agency, like you did. You probably could have had a hundred different offers mm-hmm. in different in different directions. You chose a path that you felt like going back to Scott Tyndall, and I'm not so sure there weren't conversations had between you two. But you chose the one that when you played that blackjack jack hand, you said, this decision I'm making, portal insurance, is going to give me the very best chance I have mm-hmm. to be successful long term. Be happy. Yeah, oh, the, okay. the, the big thing. And right. that's, yeah. that, that's you defining success. Mm-hmm. That's exactly right. right. It goes back to we all have to define success for ourselves. Right. No one else can de- decide for you your mm-hmm. success formula, and they also can't decide for your, cool. you, your definition. And if they try to... Then they need to. You need to push them back off of you if they're trying to tell you what your definition of success needs to be. And my definition of success is is playing the game of business for the love of the game. Sure. And I can't do that working for somebody else or having mm-hmm. somebody else tell me what to do. I got job offers within an hour. Oh, I know you did. You know, I, I, um, I know you and, did. And I, 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 I'm not going to work for anybody but myself. You know, and, unless, and and you and I talked about some of that. And I would uh-huh. jokingly say, "Oh, Bradley's going to be a pixie dust spreader on the tilt world." Yep. I knew what was going on, and I knew you were. And I think, and and it's why if you go, back, Josh, uh, Josh Scott did a very good idea of, <laughs> of 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 I don't know what the hell he's doing <laughs> when people ask. Yeah, I, I just I just kept playing. Stupid, even though you were, I don't know, very me, much in the know. Oh yeah, but but I go back to episode I think episode two or three of our podcast was, and you you've touched on it, Scott Tyndall, you've touched on it in this podcast. Before you make that decision to play that blackjack hand, 
you better go get you some damn mentors mm -hmm. yeah. that can help you make a decision that's a lifetime decision that's a very big decision. You know, we talked about luck a little bit, but it's also giving yourself that best chance. And right. sometimes you need third-party outside mentors like a Scott Tyndall to go to and say, hey, man, I got Bradley Flowers. I got this option, this option, this option. This is a blackjack hand. Which one gives me that? I want that 95% chance of success, Absolutely. not the 30% chance. And here's here's some something in that, too. Sometimes it's okay to play hands that have a uh, lower chance of success if you have asymmetrical reward. Ooh. Right? Ooh. So if I have a 50 we're deep. if I've we're got a deep, people. if I've got a uh, a 40% chance, right. but I can 6x my money. Right. Now, I'm still willing to make that decision. Right. Because of the asymmetrical reward. Right. So it works on both sides. You got to look at the risk and the reward. What are the odds of success there and then do that math. Right. Right? And so it, but you don't want to play in a world where you're always taking the lower odds. Right. That is a rare occasion right. when you go this. Now, this 60% chance isn't going to work out. Right. But if it does, it's worth our trouble. Jack, it, jackpot. It's worth it, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, but those are those are things you got to take into account. But, you know, I think the great takeaway from a lot of this stuff is create a success formula. Yes. Create a corporate formula. Right. Figure out how to make good with decisions. Your people, with, with your people. With your people. Your corporate formula involved. needs to be with your... And if you don't trust and that them... Doesn't, and that doesn't mean call them in and listen to what they have to say and then go, okay, thanks, guys, and then do it I don't all think yourself. So. No, I, I mean, frankly, if you're scared to do that with your team... There's a problem. That's a, that's another big red flag. Yeah. You yeah. know, and we, can, we come into the office sometimes and I find a dozen red flags, you know, those are things that can be resolved, mm -hmm. but here's the trail of how this stuff happened. Right. Um, so they may not be the right fit for your team. Doesn't mean they're bad people. Right. Or doesn't mean you're a bad people. It means it's not a good fit. Right. Mm -hmm. You know? And so it's really just how do we create these things? How do we, you know, uh, bring your team to the great leadership series, mm -hmm. hear this stuff, and then go back to your office and go, does this sense, does this make sense for us? Right. You know, we're doing uh, Atlanta, Denver, Houston, San Diego. Mobile in January, Miami, and then we'll do eight more shows in 2020. So wow. we'll be somewhere in the country that comes to you. Yeah. But additionally, if this is the type of stuff that you want to learn, just give us a call and we'll come. We'll help you. I'll jump on the phone with you and at least give you an idea on on what we do. Right. And you know, one of the things that kind of we've talked about is, let's say you know, if you want us to come to your city, get a bunch of agents and pull it all mm -hmm. together and let's mm -hmm. do it all at once. Let's right. help a whole bunch of agents at one time mm -hmm. rather than. Uh, trying to one off into right. into your communities. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, that's something that we can easily put together. In fact, um, we worked with Bradley on this and, and Laurel as well. He's like, we actually developed a full seven hour full day program on this. And we reason we did it in one day is because we can get it done in one day. Uh -huh. There's no reason to belabor this thing and drag it on into two days and uh -huh. and make everybody's life that much harder. Right. Like, let's just knock it out in seven hours. Right. And everything we do that we teach is effort based. Mm. Not a single thing is going to be budget based mm. because we can't control our budget. Sometimes right. I can't alter your budget. I maybe can give you some tips on how to increase your your close rate or your sales. Mm -hmm. But what we talk about is effort based philosophies. What are things we can do that are mm. just Build better teams, build better leaders, hire better, and then what are strategies we can put in place that are effort-based? Because, man, I used to get so frustrated. I do go to these corporate leadership stuff, and they'd say, well, if you'll just spend an extra 300% on this or that. I was like, <laughs> man, if I had an extra 300%, yeah, yeah, I, I, would, yeah I, would, right. I would have other problems than what I got. Right, right. You know, so that's when, you know, we just learned that, that we had to develop things that were effort-based. Well, I want to close this podcast out by, by circling back around insurance agents from around the world. If you have an interest uh, in, in, in either the, the GRIT uh, Leadership Academy, is that right? Did I sure, say that close enough. Yeah, man. Okay. Or the, the Voyage and Character Educational Program for your town, your kid's school, multiple schools, school district, go to www.thevoyageforschools.com uh, or, as Scott mentioned, look look him up, and he can talk more about it yeah, with you hit personally. Yeah, hit y'all up on your podcast or any yeah. of those things. We can get linked up. We, you know, we all pass information around. Uh, if you want to find out more, if your school is available, right. you can go to experientialdesigngroup.com forward slash voyage, and that will actually allow you to input your information, and we can let you know if your school is available or, or what, you know, basically... Right help you get that quote but at the end of the day for us it's just about brokering these deals man right. we've got to get people who want to support their communities who then 
uh, authentically believe right, in, right. in this being a good decision. Right. You know. Well, I went to the website last night and watched the intro video, and yep. I was I was very impressed in, you know, the the, the each anchor has four lessons and right. and and how it. You know, carries throughout the year. It's, man, it's, it's like a great program, man. I, it's it's not. You don't have to listen to me. And you don't have to believe me. Uh, right. It was created by the same people that created the Chick Fil A Leaders Academy right. and nine hundred schools in forty states. Absolutely. I mean, we're just. This is a new product that we've got to get out there and get launched. And um, it's also the type of thing where if agents want to bundle together and take on, hey, let's have five agents bundle and take right. on five schools. Right. That's fine too. Like, right. there's no rules here. Right. I mean, the rules are we got to help these kids. Exactly. That's the rule. Exactly. Well, guys. Scott, I want to tell you how much I appreciate you being here, man. Man, I just appreciate y'all having me. This I, is fun. This I, is like the highlight we, of my we day. We jokingly said in New York that we were going to do a podcast with us three, and it was going to be called Between the Two Scots. <laughs> <laughs> so, unfortunately, I did not sit between right. you guys today. Well, i tell you what. A blessing in my life is to have just, and I hate that it had to happen on the podcast, but just to spend some quality time with you like this. Yeah, this is fun. Because every time you and I are together, it just seems like different things are pulling us away from each other or we're sitting across the table from each other at dinner, right. but we can't really talk because we got people around us talking. And, and it's hard because neither one of us want to stop talking. Right. So exactly. Bradley's so then we're, we're always water, talking to so somebody else. Exactly. Take, takes conversation one direction. That's all right. <laughs> exactly. Guys, listen, get your ass out from behind that desk today. Go out in your community, help people, zero expectation in return and, and see what happens. I'm telling you, if you'll have zero expectation be authentic, want to help for the right reasons, not just because you might get 12 more quotes this year on your or month on your you know home and auto insurance, but genuinely want to help people in your community. Uh, you're, you're gonna you're gonna you know unintended consequence of that is you're gonna get more business out of that. So go out and help people. get your ass out from behind that desk today and go sell insurance. Make money for your family, make money for your wife, your kids, your parents that need help that are struggling, go out today and do it for them. Let them be your why. Let them be your why. Go write good business for the companies that you represent and go write good business for the agencies that you represent. Bradley Flowers, I love you. Thanks, man. Thanks, Scott. Scott Thank Tindall, you. I love you too. Thanks, brother. I love you too. Guys, you are listening to the Insurance Guys podcast. We love you all very much, and we are humbled that you would listen to this show, and we will see you back next week. Take care.